everyone, and welcome to today's Steris Tech Talk on radiation technology transfer for sterilization processing. Steris Tech Talks are a series of webinars covering subjects relating to gas and radiation sterilization processing and the laboratory testing and validation services which support these processes. My name is Ashley Maru, and I'm the Associate Product Manager for Steris Applied Sterilization Technologies. I'll be the host for today's event. Our presenter today is Betty Howard. Betty is the Senior Radiation Sterilization Manager in Steris AST with many years of industry experience in sterilization and microbiological testing of healthcare products, technical support, and standards development. Her previous roles include positions in microbiological testing, analytical, S or, I'm sorry, analytical instrumentation, pharmaceutical essay development, and marketing. All attendees are on mute for the presentation. However, we would like to encourage everyone to submit questions using the questions function on the GoToWebinar control panel. Questions will be answered following the presentation. Today's presentation will be recorded and uploaded to our Steris Applied Sterilization Technologies YouTube channel. Please note that continuing education credits are not provided as part of this webinar. And now over to Betty to begin the presentation. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully this provides some additional information for you on transfer between radiation modalities. Okay, um, our agenda today will be relatively short. Um, we're going to go through the different technologies available for um, ionizing radiation and the differences and similarities but then focus on the activities involved in transferring between these um, technologies and um, basic ideas of how we get to the transfer, the steps needed. Okay, um, basically when we are talking about ionizing radiation, we're talking about electron beam, gamma, or X-ray. Um, all of them have been around for decades. They've had different prominence in terms of how many of them are being used and how they're being used, but all of them are considered ionizing radiation. All of them can sterilize healthcare products and all are currently available. Okay. We're gonna look at each technology so you get a feel for it because um, many, of what, many of what we would have uh, normally just asked you to come into a plant or something to see, right now nobody can see. So I wanna make sure you're a little familiar with the process on each one. We're gonna start off with gamma. Um, in general, what you see in this uh, graphic is the, where all the carriers would be, how they would move around the source, which is that little blue box in there. And then when the source is not being used, it's stored under the, the floor level of the irradiator in a big pool of water. And that's because you can't turn off a gamma irradiator. The radioactive material will continue to decay as soon as it's made, it starts to decay and it will continue to decay. If it's stored under the, under the floor in the um, enclosed protected area in the water, um, it allows for people to be able to go in and out of the irradiator safely. Um, electron beam, it's going to be a bit different in what it would look like. In its case, you're going to have um, attached to it will be an a radi electrical source which will be the source of the energy to create the electrons needed for the process. The machinery itself is going to accelerate those electrons and then pass them through a vacuum tube and focus them into a really tight spot of energy. And that energy spot will then be um, oscillated very rapidly back and forth across what you see in this picture as the scan horn. Product boxes will go Pass that horn, and as they're passing the horn, that's when they will be hit with electrons. I want you to focus on the size of that product box assembly at the bottom versus what you'll see in some of the other products. Now, the location of that horn could be in any position, really. Um, there are some um, e-beam units which will have the horn above the product, some below, some with one above and one below somewhere it's to the side and the products are passing in carriers, but ultimately the product is only being irradiated when it is in front of that scan horn. Okay. 
x-ray will look a lot, and in fact, for the most part, very similar to identical to that assembly you just saw with E-beam. The difference will be what happens to those electrons after they come out of the scan horn. In order to become x-ray, they have to hit um, a metal plate that's made out of tantalum, and that's the converter process. When the electrons hit it, most of them will not go through due to the density of the uh, metal. But what does come through will be photons, just like the photons you were getting from gamma, but with more variability in terms of their energy level. Those photons, just like gamma photons, can very heavily penetrate a product. So you get the benefit of the, the uh, density penetration that you get from gamma, also with x-ray, without having to have a radioactive source. Now look at the size of the pile of product that you have versus what you saw with the EE. Now I want to focus on the differences as well as the similarities. So if you look at these slides, um, I'm showing you that they both E-beam and X-ray start in the same place. There's a plug, which you can unplug or turn off. So there's an on-off switch for E-beam and X-ray. The electricity is critical because that's what's entering the process to create the accelerated electrons. That process is the same until you get to the converter plate in X-ray. Okay. Um, this slide I find very useful just in general when I'm trying to explain the difference between the photon processes, X-ray and gamma. It's a little clearer and easier to understand, I think, it, the difference between an electron and a photon. It's different when you're trying to look at two things that are both photons. Um, the reason I like this slide is it shows you the energy levels of the gamma, which are 1.17 and 1.33 MeV. That's an average of 1.25. And then this graphic on the right shows you that there's a wider variation in the energy levels of the photons coming off of an X-ray. But the more important part is the little picture at the bottom to me. The um, photons off of a radioactive source are isotropic. That means they're coming off at every angle, front, back, up, down, every degree across because the radioactive source is decaying. It doesn't sit there and focus on where your product is. We, we use that to process products efficiently, but remember that is isotropic. They're going all over the place. When you have an X-ray unit, those electrons are coming in in a direction off that scan horn, and what's coming out is also directional. So your um, X-ray is being focused directionally, not isotropically. And that actually also helps with penetration. Okay. Similarities and differences. They're all ionizing sources. They all create most of their effect through secondary electrons, regardless of what the source coming in is. They all have equal microbiological effectiveness and the rules for setting dose and regulatory um, processes for setting dose and for calling something sterile are the same but there will be differences that we would want to consider when you're looking at any one of the three of these. There will be differences in the energy level, how many MEVs you've got. There will be differences in penetration depth with an electron versus a photon. There will be different dose rates, how fast your kilograys are getting to your product, whether it's kilograys per second, kilograys per hour, or a difference in how many kilograys per hour. The total amount of temperature change that your product might see, um, the maximum that's achievable, can be different because you're spending different amounts of time in front of the ionizing field and the rate at which things are being delivered. Exposure time, that's how much time something is actually in the ionizing field. So in an E-beam unit or an X-ray unit, that's how much time you're in front of the actual um, scan horn. And in gamma, it's how much time you spend in the irradiator because once your product is in there and the source is lifted, it is being irradiated and it's irradiated until it's coming out. The important thing about the differences is you want to have some idea of what, what that impact is of these types of changes on the product's properties. Um, I mentioned just a minute ago that the secondary electrons were doing all of the work. Well, that first phrase on this slide, dose is dose, is something my industry uses all the time, but people don't always 
understand why we're saying that. And the reason we say it is that the amount of kilograys needed to kill the bio burden on your product is the same whether you're doing gamma, x-ray, or e-beam. All three modalities create ionization in your material. That's their mode of action. Um, each ionization, once it hits a product, the, molecule, the atoms in your product will also get ionized and send out other electrons. So uh, think of it as like um, billiard balls. When you hit one, you see all of them start to spread out across the, the depth of your product. But think of that happening with many, many collisions coming in. So you're getting that distribution you need to make sure your entire product load is getting sterilized. So the electrons created are forcing that product. within uh, radiation is that there will be somehow some difference in the in effectiveness of killing microorganisms. That's just not true. There are many publications that show this. Um, a couple are mentioned here, but there are, it's well known that they're not. And one of the basis of that, if you think about it, is dose in radiation is not set by the, moda the the technology that's being used to deliver the radiation. It's based on bio burden, which is unirradiated. So the dose that you need is related to bio burden in dose tables within 11137. So that the dose you need, whether you're doing E-beam, X-ray, or gamma as your minimum dose, will be the same for all three of the, the technologies. We then start looking at what we have to consider in terms of regulatory compliance on our dose setting. Um, what ISO regulations, for example, would apply. Um, the beauty of this is, is notice I have this under a slide that says similarity, because these are the same for all three technologies. The guidance that you get for process control, the directions you get for possible ways to set your dose, how you qualify your product in unique cases like tissue or needing some alternate methods for a sampling. What you need to do in terms of your sterile barrier package to testing, biological evaluations, all of these are from the same guidance document. And what that means is none of these three technologies are considered novel, including x-ray. Sometimes people think x-ray because they haven't used it means it's novel. The standards have carried x-ray for decades. Okay. Now I want to start looking at where, if we compare the same thing in all three technologies. Uh, none of these numbers are meant to mean this is the exact dose you should use for every product, but I want you to see what might be different if you were doing gamma, x-ray, or even. Um, first off, that mode of action, the isotropic nature of the photons in gamma, the straight charged electrons coming at it with e-beam, and the photons with a variety of energy levels coming off of x-ray. Now, it, as an example, if I had a product that was, in this case, an example that was tested uh, at 0.2 grams per cc, probably the most common range you'll ever see in gamma is 25 to 40 kilogram. Ideally, you like to have it a little wider if you can. That's why it says ideal 25 to 50. The same product with the same density range with e-beam likely we'll need a slightly higher max dose to be able to deliver it because of that penetration difference. So you may see 25 to 40 become 25 to 50. Um, with x-ray, you can, in most cases, most people will use the same dose range that they used for gamma, but we do see on certain products and certain densities and such or how it's, um, the product works in the system after it's mapped, that sometimes that 40 can even be lower and say it's 35. The dose rate between the three will vary, and this is probably the most noticeable difference in all of them. Um, gamma is delivered in kilograys per hour. So, for example, that 25 to 40 kilogray range could take, oh, let's, let's say we'll give it an example, four hours. Um, the same thing delivered in e-beam, though, is delivered in kilograys per second. 
So all the energy you need is going in very, very rapidly. And an X-ray, it'll still be kilograms per hour, but frequently is half um, as much as you would do with gamma. Um, the temperature your product might see has many variables to it. Um, not to eliminate the product materials itself. Some product, some materials um, have more specific heat when they're irradiated, or more may hold or retain heat longer than others. But the basic differences in the system will depend on the design of the instrument in gamma the cobalt activity in e-beam, uh, essentially driven by the power of the machine, and in X-ray power and design are going to be critical to what that temperature is. Um, now we're talking about like total temperature that your product might see over the time it's being in process. Um, typical temperatures you see in a production irradiator for terminal sterilization might be at 45 to 50 uh, C in gamma. Um, be a little higher in EB because the temperature of the, the kilograms are all being delivered instantaneously. So there's no dissipation slowness to that. And in X-ray, frequently it won't be higher than gamma, but many times it is lower because it can be delivered in multiple pass systems. Okay. To give you a graphical representation of the difference in penetration, that first yellow graph, that's E-beam. E-beam electrons come in, they start to pile up when they come in, they start to lose their forward motion, and then they, it, it will dissipate down because every collision will cause that electron to lose its energy. That, that we take that into account when we process though, so don't worry about that. Um, X-ray and gamma will have much deeper penetration. Continuing with that, the way you process it where it's passing the ionization field more than once or from many different sides, give you a really nice uniformity over those wide depths. Um, X-ray and gamma, Let's say with gamma, where you do um, at least the product is going around the source. So each time it goes around the source, a different side is facing the source. So that cumulative effect will give you this nice flat distribution. Electron beam, you'll get a two-sided process so that you get enough dose to the center to be able to give you your minimum dose all the way through your product. But notice that means there's a peak on both sides, which is why frequently your maximum dose will be a little higher. Um, this graph shows a like-for-like -like comparison a palette in gamma and a palette in x-ray where they compared the DUR, uh, the dose uniformity ratio. Um, and that's the one that says how tight you might be able to deliver the dose. And in this case, with this particular load of product and palette to palette, not palette to, get to, to carrier in gamma, you got an, a 14% improvement in the DUR. Um, probably the biggest area of questions, because we can show you many things that make X-ray look very appealing, could give you more capacity with another photon energy, um, but that means a change. If you're doing gamma, then what happens when I start using X-ray? And we want to start talking to get you familiar which things are expected to do when you're going to make these kinds of change. So your the areas we're going to look at is what will it affect your minimum dose? How do you document that? Will it affect your maximum dose? Meaning does it affect your product's performance? Do I have to do another dose map, PQ? And something that's unique to X-ray in, in these systems, um, act, something called activation. Okay, I always start everything that has to do with dose at looking at the maximum. Um, we're lucky in that the standards, even though a lot of these technologies were not very popular years and years ago, the standards do bring up guidance on what you should do when you make change. And it's all in section 8 of 11137-1. Start off with that the maximum dose acceptable for a product has to be established. When you treat your product with a maximum dose, all the functions that you need it to do have to be maintained for the defined life of the product. This statement is true for X-ray, E-beam, and gamma, all three, not one or the other. When you start get a little farther into section eight, particularly 8.4, they start talking about transfers between modalities or between sources. 
And that's where um, some of the confusion starts to come up or trying to figure out what types of things I can do to support a change in a initially even a like for like transfer of a source, um, a radiator. Okay. Now, what can happen when you give your product a maximum dose? Well, we have to think about what parameters might cause these effects. Um, the dose rate could be different. The exposure time will be different if the dose rate is. The total amount of dose that it might see, min and max, is it an achievable dose? And how much temperature effect will this have on my product? And this graphic here kind of compares, you know, which one's highest or most likely to be good. But in the end, all three modalities will probably work. You just have to be aware that some of these variations where there are differences could have an impact on your maximum dose. Um, such considerations, the design of the irradiator, the power, the activity, how many passes it makes uh, past the ionizing source, the energy level of the system. These can affect, potentially affect the materials. Um, Amy 111, no, Amy, sorry, Amy TIR 17 is compatibility materials TIR. And it's a good place to start on um, comparing materials, especially with a new product, so that you can pick materials that would be expected to tolerate dose well. Um, it's not it's not going to help you much once the materials are already selected because that the, the resin is complete, it's already in your product. But it might give you a guidance on where to go if you have more than one choice. But the reason why this slide's in here is I want you to look at the bottom of this chart. When you start getting into things that are red and the uh, or red and yellow, these are materials that can have effects with radiation not one technology or another they are the same things that will have an effect with any product that is radiated um, for example ptfe or teflon is going to be a problem with any of the technologies switching from one to the other is probably not going to solve or reduce that type of problem because their mode of action is the same the maximum acceptable dose that's the thing you did all that work to set your minimum based on your bio burden um, will any of these critical parameters do something to my product that I have to worry about? Um, but this slide, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is the summary for the maximum dose. Those technologies or these parameters, how could they have affected my material? Um, could I have gotten more molecular recombination than I was expecting? Will the uh, amount of time my product is being exposed be impacted by ozone created in the system? Is the process capable of being able to deliver my min and my max? And will any change in the temperature it sees have an effect? The best advice anybody can give you on this is knowing what the current modality use, you use is, has, what effects it has on your product. Um, if you do that, for example, and you're comparing gamma to x-ray, frequently people can consider the gamma work they did as a worst case. Um, there's nothing that I can tell you that will support that for any product, but it does mean if you're seeing risks as with certain things in the parameters that are critical to your product with gamma, those are the areas that you probably want to focus on when you look at whether a particular dose is acceptable in x-ray because the mode of action is the same the solutions for most people we're seeing more and more literature on this more and more seminars on it but it's not clear cut in all of the standards and this is an area that um, opens up a lot more questions but we'll all get there together um, most people will say now you use a risk-based approach to plan your testing for your maximum dose. You have to assume you have to do something to show that if you change modalities or change technologies, that you will have an acceptable result. Most of the time, they'll probably be equivalent. You won't notice much change. But because certain parameters are known to be the most sensitive, those are the ones you want to look at. If you leverage what you already know, this assessment can be much less daunting as it for, than it first see, it seems. 
publications, seminars can help to support your test plan, but having a plan and having a reason for why you're testing certain things will be valuable to you. Um, now we'll get to the minimum. I apologize for the delay before. Um, when you're doing the minimum dose, there's a section 8.4.2 that tells you about transference of the verification dose, the dose used for sterility testing in your audits, and for the terminal sterilization dose. It's not ri written very clearly, but when you sit down and look at it, it does give you good guidance. And if you add to it the annexes for these sections, you get a lot more guidance. It says right off the bat, it starts with something that sounds really bad. It says transference of the verification dose or sterilization dose to a radiation source different from that which the dose was originally established shall not be permitted. But then it says less. And the first thing it says, data is available to de demonstrate that the change in the conditions of the two radiation sorts did not alter the microbiological effectiveness. And then it says or. But right there, that statement. The, what, jumps, what should jump out at you when you hear that is it wants me to prove microbiological effectiveness. How do we normally do that? Dose audits. So if you look at it as, okay, minimally, I have to do a dose audit to show that the same verification dose gives me the same kill. The next one, when we get to OR, is where a lot more, there's not as much information, but when you combine it with what's in the annexes, and what's in publications, there is some help to get you through those possibilities. But notice it says or. Okay. Um, 8.4.2.2, it first off says if there's no liquid water present, transference of the verification dose between sources, gamma to gamma, x-ray to x-ray, those are perfectly okay. Um, products that contain liquid water. There is a reference in this document to a paper from in the 60s that was not the perfect test, did not necessarily control all of the parameters we know today, but it did evoke some concern about liquid water being present. If for no other reason that if, for example, using one irradiator or another one was going to cause the amount of time it took to be processed to change, meaning from transport or something like that, it could, in theory, affect the effectiveness of the verification dose or the minimum dose. But when you start looking at the annexes, in both cases, in 8.4.2.2, it says when there's concern, how do you accomplish a showing the microbiological effectiveness? By performing a successful verification dose experiment, meaning a dose audit. In Two point, the 8.4.2.3, this is the part about water. It says to demonstrate that the fact that the water was there did not affect the microbiological effectiveness, what do you do? A dose audit. Always remember that the bio burden is used for all three of these systems, EBM, X-ray, and gamma, the same dose, but you still have to know what the limitations are on your product. Can your product, is your, is your product capable of growing if it isn't irradiated in a certain amount of time? As long as you keep to all that you know about the product, the proof of microbiological effectiveness will come from your dose audits. The next one, we talked about PQ, performance qualification or mapping. No matter what change you made in the radiator, if you change the irradiator you're processing in, whether you're changing technologies or not, you have to do a map of that system. Maps don't transfer between irradiators. So, and that's clearly written in 11137 as well. You need to do this to assure that the distribution of dose across your product is being achieved, the dose range that you need. Okay. And that last section that I said was a little different for first, but then most of you are probably familiar with is the term activation. Activation is referring to the potential of the energy that we're delivering to activating, meaning make, at least for a short period of time, some component of a product radioactive. Um, if your product is being irradiated with X-ray, where the energy of, that act energy of that source is greater than 5 MeV, which it will be in the systems we're talking about, 
or in eBeam where it's greater than 10 MeV, which is in most cases not a concern. Most commercial eBeam units run at 10 MeV or less. Even if there's, a, there's very little risk of activation, most people are going to have to or would want to test to confirm that there's no danger to their product after it's been irradiated. We do know from 10 years of having an operating x-ray machine in doing healthcare products in Switzerland that all the products and polymers we've tested, implants, plastics, at their maximum dose have never been declared active. Um, that those tests in Switzerland were performed through a government um, a laboratory and are also currently performed at the Steris Libertyville Radiation Technology Center. But the important thing is there's a lot of information to alleviate some of the concerns people may have about what activation means. And a really good source of reading and the background is this article in the um, Industrial Sterilization um, documents from Amy. Um, these are publications, not standards, and they're recent. This one was published in uh, just last June. Now, when I talk about a risk-based approach, what does that really mean in terms of what I have to, to test or how risky is the change going to be? If you look at the three of the, or the, all the parameters that we were talking about that might be of concern and you rate them, the one that should be the worst, the best, are um, about the same. You will find out that there, there's possibilities on this, but this is where you start looking at which of these things would be most important to my product, which could affect changes in my materials before you make your plan for how you're going to test. Okay. Then you look at, I looked at those risks, how risky are these different things? And what you'll find is there's either no risk of a change between X-ray and gamma, or it's very little. Because for photon to photon, they're still photons. They're still going through a product very easily, and their effect, their mode of action is the same. So you don't expect great changes due to any of these parameters. The important thing is designing a plan, considering those risks, Compare, for example, what you saw in gamma and look at what the most desirable things to test are. The other good news here is that higher dose rates are considered to have less impact on performance of materials than lower dose rates. So when you compare X-ray and gamma, X-ray, if anything, should have at least slightly less potential because it is delivered so much faster. There are many publications and seminars being done right now to provide more and more information and I've listed a few more references after this. Um, publications looking at the minimum dose, there's an article by Joyce Hansen and Trevi Bryan in um, the, modal the process optimization and modality document for the industrial sterilization from Amy. There's a really good paper on the different effects of microbiological effectiveness of Alan Talian Tires group, and that's in radiation physics and chemistry. When we start looking at the maximum dose and the effects of what, what happens when you have a photon that's different, um, there's a really good one in um, one of the other optimization, sterilization, industrial sterilization um, papers. X-ray of the, the um, single use bioprocessing equipment products have been looked at quite frequently through publications from BPSA as including this year. And there was even a workshop that was recorded from BPSA yesterday looking at the um, risk assessment approach to um, these products from that, based on that article that's over to the right. Um, change in the sterilization modalities. There have been other papers published on this, and I, I list, list at least a couple here for you. Um, we're getting there. Consider always, when you're looking at these modality changes, consider minimum dose support with a dose audit with your existing verification dose to confirm that microbiological effectiveness. Remap the product in the configuration it's going to be used. Um, and 
assess the critical factors first and foremost and say in your design plan why you're testing those things so that you can get a broad um, coverage of data to support that the change is not affecting your product. It's important to collect the data to make sure you are looking at what's important for your product. There isn't a place where somebody can tell you exactly which tests to do, but the comparison between the two technologies will give you the data you need to support change. Okay, I thank you all for listening to this seminar today. Thanks again for joining us today. This concludes the webinar.